Okay. Well, good morning. As you can see, this talk is brought to us by our sponsor, the New Small Animal Radiator, which is now open for business. So we hope for enthusiastic participation, interest in that and contact the folks you see there. But today's talk is going to be given by Dr. Christine Fisher. Most of you know Dr. Fisher. She's an associate professor of radiation oncology. She graduated from Middlebury in molecular biology and biochemistry before attending Chicago Medical School, where she was elected AOA. She then more or less simultaneously accomplished a radiation oncology residency at MD Anderson Hospital and then an MPH at the Gilling School of Public Health in North Carolina. And she wears a lot of hats here. I don't have time to show you all the hats she wears. She's one of our busiest people around. She is a program director for our, our residency training program. And she's also, among other things, a co-director with Dr. Jen Diamond of the Women's Cancer Developmental Therapeutics Program, which is a relatively new initiative. And she's here today to speak about some clinical and translational observations in the territory of breast cancer that I'm sure you'll find enjoyable. So without further ado, Dr. Fisher, thank you. All right, thank you for the kind introduction, Brian. Welcome to everyone. I hope the pizza's going well. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a specific subset of brain metastasis, so HER2-positive brain metastasis in breast cancer, and we're going to explore the interaction of high-dose focal radiation or radiosurgery and targeted therapy. I think this is a really uh, interesting story, and as you'll see from some of the slides, actually a lot of this work has been done at University of Colorado. We thought we knew what the first work was, but we actually, via some collaborations with Diana Satelli, found that some of the very, very early work showing this collaboration, even before it got into patients, was done at University of Colorado. So really a fun story that went from bench to bedside, back to bench, and hopefully we're heading back to bedside with some practice-changing findings. So in terms of the talk today, I'm going to go through some background on the topic. I'm going to talk about a targeted therapy that's used in HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer called trastuzumab emtansine, or TDM1, as it will be referred to primarily during the talk. We'll talk about stereotactic radiosurgery, which also will be referred to as SRS, and this is very high-dose focal radiation to brain metastasis. We'll talk about some of the clinical work that happened here at uh, University of Colorado with patient observations and then a subsequent larger study, seeing how patients are doing with this combination. We'll then go into some mechanistic work that's been a collaboration of a number of different departments here. And finally, talk about some future directions for this research and where we hope to go with it. For those of you who may be in the lab more than the clinic, I'll try to keep things as relevant as possible to a broad audience. So what I have here is our uh, graphic along with this is an MRI brain that we never want to see. So we're seeing lots of um, edema or swelling. It's very unclear what's going on in this clinical scenario. And these are the kind of scans that, as clinicians, we really dread discussing with our patients because we don't know if there's tumor, radiation necrosis, some combination thereof. In order to really drive home what's going on in terms of the talk, we're going to talk about the take-home points up front, and then we'll revisit them after we've gone through some of the data. So probably the most critical take-home point is that we're actually doing really well in terms of survival with these patients. If you look at the classic data for metastatic cancer to the brain, and specifically breast cancer, this actually showed very poor survival. Depending on what intervention or no intervention, patients might live three to six months, sometimes a year with some of our best therapy. In order to see these interesting combinations of toxicity and this potentiation, we have to ha keep patients alive long enough to actually recognize it. So the first point is really that these women are living longer and longer um, and surviving longer and longer due to advances in both local therapy, like radiosurgery, as well as uh, systemic therapy or whole body therapy. We will also um, talk about how these two interact together and actually get into some of the mechanisms. So this was a clinical observation that actually had some bench work previously done that sort of, I don't know if I'd say swept under the rug, but was, was lost to science for some time. And then this actually led to a lot of work here at the University of Colorado in uh, Diana Satelli's lab, who really has a um, focus on brain metastasis and was able to help us elucidate some of what was and wasn't going on. In terms of the mechanism, we think we're getting pretty close. Um, our first hypothesis didn't work out, but I'll show you some of that data and kind of show you where we went next in terms of mechanistic work and why we think this is looking promising, kind of how we're going to try to really prove that. 
And then I think maybe one of the more important take home points as well is that this is really practice changing. So we wanna get this information out. We wanna have these women who have metastatic breast cancer of the brain really get treated in the safest way. So we want it both effective and also safe in terms of minimizing any additional toxicity as we can. So our goal really is to improve quality and quantity of life. So in terms of some basics about um, breast cancer, so for metastatic breast cancer patients, roughly one in seven will develop brain metastasis. So most women will have bony disease for estrogen responsive or visceral disease, meaning lung or liver. A certain subset of all comers will develop brain metastasis. If we drill down further into the HER2 positive brain metastasis population, this is where we see a profound incidence. And so of these women, nearly half with metastatic cancer will develop brain metastasis. What's uh, often a very challenging clinical scenario is that they may never have any metastasis anywhere else in their body. So the brain will be, sometimes the, within the spinal cord, will be the only site that the cancer ever comes back. Everything outside of the skull and the spinal canal is completely negative. And so this really brings to um, bear that local therapy remains critical in these patients, but balanced with getting them drugs that also work well and help to control this disease. And as I'd emphasize in one of the take home points, many of these women are gonna live for years with brain metastasis. And this wasn't true in the old, older practice until fairly recently. But we, within patients in these series, have women that are alive three, four. I think the record right now is uh, someone who's had brain metastasis for seven years. That's a pretty incredible story. And it wasn't something, again, that we'd saw, seen until recently. So again, thinking about kind of keeping this talk appealing to a broad audience, again, we're looking at MRI brain, and this might be the kind of um, brain metastasis that we'd see on a scan. So typically, we want to find these before they're uh, symptomatic, so we'll be doing ideally regular screening MRIs to try to look for the, a disease like that. So looking at the literature, if you search radiosurgery and this drug, TDM1 or the trastuzumab emtansine, the oldest report uh, of clinical observations was actually uh, originated here. And what happened was um, a small series of patients, it was based on four cases, were observed to have an awful lot of edema and clinically significant toxicity with this combination. And again, this was a very new drug. It was approved in 2013. And so by 2014, given our, uh, our high volume breast center, we were able to again, see some of these patients come through and just put out that this association was present. We really didn't have any mechanistic work at that point. We did have some hypotheses put forward in the paper as to what was going on. But um, this was really uh, a bellwether. And again, if you were to put these topics into Google, you'll actually see patient discussions and what have you that reference this. So this was really a seminal observation that went out into the, into the literature. So I'm gonna talk a little about what drug we're talking about. So for um, our HER2 positive patients, one of the first really exciting breakthroughs was called Herceptin or Trastuzumab. This is a monoclonal antibody that targets HER2, which is overexpressed or present in high copy number in many um, breast cancers. And there are certain subsets like young women that tend to get this in higher uh, percentages. So from Herceptin, we found that this worked really well in the body. It cut recurrences in about half. That said, many women would still develop metastatic disease on trastuzumab, and this sanctuary site was the brain. Because this monoclonal antibody wasn't optimally able to get into the brain, this was often where we saw that, uh, that recurrence. Additionally, some patients would also develop resistance to this mechanism. And I'll talk about the mechanism a little bit more in a moment. But this led to the drug industry essentially looking for other ways to still have a very targeted therapy specific for these cells overexpressing HER2, but perhaps find a different method to ensure continued cytotoxicity and try to avoid resistance as possible. So this led to the development of TDM1 or trastuzumab emtansine. And what that is is the Herceptin monoclonal antibody, so still specifically targeted to HER2, but it has attached to it via a linker a um, cytotoxic agent that attacks uh, the microtubule formation. And so this is called uh, mertansine or emtansine and a couple other names that are out there. But essentially, it's this linked um, drug that contains both the antibody as well as the cytotoxic agent that really was specific for this clinical toxicity that we are seeing. And again, as I mentioned, this was approved in 2013. 
We have not even really seen clinical results for five years, so this is all very new data that's developing. This is a really brief overview of the HER family. Um, so within the um, picture you're going to see in blue is HER2. And so this is the specific uh, domain of the HER family that we're discussing as a target for breast cancer. This will dimerize with other members of the HER family, either another HER2 or any of the others. Basically, there's a HER1 through 4. Once this is dimerized, this activates an intracellular cascade that promotes proliferation, survival, uh, metastasis, and invasion. And so this is a really critical um, discovery, again, for Herceptin. That's been in uh, use a long time. But again, this really led to one of the first true targeted therapies in any cancer, and specifically in breast cancer. And so what you're seeing within C is the activity of trastuzumab. So again, this is a fairly typical um, antibody. This can help bind to HER2 uh, monomer and black cleavage and also prevent dimerization with another member of the HER family. And so this helps pr promote both a cytotoxic impact within the immune system uh, for tumor lysis and degradation of the HER2. So digging into this drug a little bit further, again, the trastuzumab emtansine or TDM1 has that same antibody shown here. So this is the trastuzumab, a linker that allows the two uh, proteins to be connected, and then this DM1 or this cytotoxic uh, antitubulin agent. This is a very toxic drug, so even on its own, it's actually quite toxic, but the trastuzumab allows a really novel way of delivering this in an intracellular manner. And so... Um, this is derived from uh, metansine, which is a, a natural product um, microtubule polymerization inhibitor. And we're going to come back to this in a little bit because we have some very early preclinical work at University of Colorado that actually involved this molecule. And again, just compared to kind of a classic chemotherapy, it's very, very potent at intracellular uh, cytotoxicity. So just briefly, when TDM1 came out, we had some other standard of care therapies after progression on Herceptin, and this showed a substantial improvement both in progression-free survival, so this is TDM1 in blue, versus another uh, agent combination that was felt to have some activity in the brain, uh, lapatinib capecitabine, so that showed both an improvement in progression-free survival as well as overall survival, and the difference was on the order of five months or so. Um, and again, in blue, you're going to see your TDM1 with improvements in um, overall survival compared to the next best agent at that time. So let's think about the radiation component now. So we've talked a little about what this targeted therapy is. So for radiation, much analogous to chemotherapy moving to targeted therapy, we've had a similar evolution of how we treat um, cancers and specifically those that have metastasis in the brain. What I've put here is a couple different ways of depicting um, whole brain radiation. That's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. A beam comes from either side. We essentially block out the eyes and the mouth and the throat and what have you and treat the entire rest of the skull and brain. And as you would imagine, while this does not miss cancer in the brain itself, it also adds extra tox toxicity in terms of neurocognition, short-term memory formation, and other concerns. Also for breast cancer patients, one other um, unfortunate side effect that uh, is definitely noted by patients that have had it is that it causes hair loss and often a permanent hair loss in an unfortunate pattern called a reverse mohawk where they have specific hair loss here on the head and hair elsewhere. So you can imagine for a woman that's a fairly uh, devastating outcome if that were to be permanent for the remaining years of her life. So in terms of whole brain, the classic way to give it was over 10 doses or fractions at a total of 30 gray. So overall, this is not a curative dose for a carcinoma like a breast cancer, but it's enough to keep things under control for a year or more, typically in the brain, for lesions up to a certain size. From whole brain radiation, much like moving from chemotherapy to targeted therapy, we've also evolved to use a much more focal technique. So... Um, what we have here is a linear accelerator, basically a machine that's able to generate x-rays. Quite simply, we speed electrons up to a very fast rate, strike a tungsten target, and create x-rays. that We can filter out different energies and essentially create a beam of the strength and uh, energy and size that we would like. And we can modify the shape with um, small, essentially, pieces of metal that can move in and out of the beam. 
And so in order to do radio surgery, instead of that simple beam, one from each side, we'd actually use different arcs of beams uh, with, with this particular technique that would all converge on the area that we want to treat. So this is a MRI from a patient who, again, is a um, woman with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. And what we're seeing is brain metastasis in the right cerebellum and how the radiosurgery dose can wrap very tightly around where we want to treat and optimally spare normal tissue nearby. And so we're able to, again, deliver a much higher equivalent dose, so have better local control, while also sparing normal tissue that's uninvolved, and so really minimizing the toxicity from radiation as, as best as possible. This has now been in use for quite a long time and has very good data in terms of safety and efficacy. In centers that have a high volume of radiosurgery, the risk of radiation necrosis, or essentially causing damage to normal uh, brain tissue nearby to the tumor should be somewhere in the order of 5% or so without a lot of interaction from the nearby drugs. That'll vary a little bit depending on the series that you look at, but overall it's a relatively uncommon toxicity. That said, when we do an MRI after radiation, we always want to assume that any changes seen, especially in short order, are related to radiation. So we don't immediately call our neurosurgery colleagues and say, we see some swelling, can you go ahead and take this out? We basically try to be pretty conservative and minimize any high toxicity interventions like additional surgery. Here's another way of looking at the uh, radio surgery, the high-dose focal radiation, just again depicting beams that are delivered at different angles and that are converging on the area of the brain that we want to treat. So instead of treating the entire brain as we did previously, um, we're able to treat a very focal area. I will uh, point out Dr. Kavanaugh over there who introduced me was probably one of the earliest people in the country, I think, to truly understand and adapt his practice to move away from whole brain radiation and really more towards a radio surgery. I think five years or so later, the rest of our field followed suit. But again, I think recognizing that we could really move in the same targeted direction as our medical oncology colleagues have was a really big step forward in terms of keeping these patients alive and with as good a quality of life as possible for as long as possible. Uh, one more way to kind of look at the radio surgery. So I have some different axial slices of the brain MRI. And this is essentially showing some of the low dose and then high dose areas that we want to treat. So within different views, we're able to really help focally treat that area, provide very high local control, and again, optimally spare other normal tissue nearby that isn't necessarily involved by the tumor. So I'm going to take you through an example of a patient who was one of the earlier HER2 positive patients treated with TDM1 and radiosurgery and just show kind of how things might go. So this was a young woman and uh, asymptomatic, had an MRI brain performed, and we saw this small abnormality in the right cerebellum. Um, of interest, even though I don't think we understand the mechanism yet, so I didn't really touch upon it in this talk, these metastases seem to have a predilection for the cerebellum in particular. So this is the area that helps with balance and coordination. Um, with problems in the cerebellum, you might see people with a wide base gait or holding on to walls or what have you as they walk. So it's a very distinct pattern if there's uh, disease and bother in the cerebellum, and it's a huge decrement to quality of life. So often that's unfortunately the area that we're seeing these. And again, so in this case, we see this asymptomatic uh, brain metastasis. And so after a discussion with neurosurgery and the medical oncologist and what have you, we went ahead and did our high-dose focal radiation. This is a slightly older planning system than we use now, but it gives the gist where we have our disease that we're treating with the high dose very close to where we've mapped out the tumor, and then also the low dose still relatively close in terms of proximity. So we're able to largely spare the rest of the cerebellum um, and certainly the rest of the brain above the posterior fossa from high dose radiation. So within about a month or so of radio surgery, an MRI was done, a total success story. It looks great. The spot is just about gone. Our work is done. We can congratulate ourselves and what have you. But uh, if you look here, you basically just see this very small area. It's, it's really subtle to pick up. I'm not sure how well it's projecting, but it's basically like a very linear scar-like area uh, from what looked like uh, more of a rounded kind of a typical metastatic appearance pretreatment. Unfortunately, as we got further out from treatment and the patient continued on TDM1 therapy, we started to see this change from being 
nearly uh, inappreciable on a brain MRI, to actually seeing it almost looked as though the tumor was growing back. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way on imaging to tell if that's actually happening. So there is a very low percentage of patients that could have a tumor recurrence, meaning they didn't get local control from their radiosurgery. But there's also the risk that this is related to the radiation itself or a necrosis or death of normal brain tissue from the radiation. Clearly, if that's the case, we don't want to radiate it further. So we really try, again, to be pretty conservative in managing these patients clinically. Fortunately, this lesion continued to progress and started causing symptoms. And so two years after her initial radiosurgery, she ended up um, meeting Dr. Ormond and his team and going to neurosurgery. And this area was removed. And again, from this brain lesion in the right cerebellum, we saw no viable tumor, um, but therapy-induced necrosis. As this was happening with this patient, we had several other patients undergoing the, the exact same pathway. And we started, again, the early report came out in 2014, but we continued to watch this population really closely and try to build some additional data, as well as start to potentially run some experiments and collaborate with our colleagues in pathology to try to figure out what was going on. So coming back to this, again, this was our initial report from University of Colorado, just essentially describing this via four case series and putting forth a potential mechanism, but with no actual uh, mechanistic work. And so just to briefly go through the treatment, this was um, basically the radio surgery plan, similar to what we've looked uh, at previously, just in black and white in this case, so very high dose, and then low dose areas in the left temporal lobe. And then if we look again a year and a half or so later, we're actually seeing this very profound edema around this lesion. Unfortunately, these, as we get more and more swelling in the brain and the skull is not able to adapt to that extra pressure, it ends up compressing nearby brain and threatening function in those areas locally or sometimes globally, causing symptoms like nausea, vomiting, headache. And so unfortunately, as I was saying, the the typical pathway for the patients at that point is initiating steroids, which do have some substantial side effects in terms of quality of life as well, and then calling up our colleagues in neurosurgery and saying, hey, we've got this, this area that's expanding. We can't tell on imaging if it's disease or if it's necrosis. Can you go ahead and remove this, and let's see what's going on. Uh, this is what I was alluding to earlier. So if we actually look back in 2011, there was a report from University of Colorado in Drosophila showing that this drug, which at that point was called metansinol and radiation, were um, very toxic. And so that what I've shown here is actually a Drosophila graph. Again, percent survival to adulthood is a good clue. It's not a human uh, graph that we're looking at. But essentially, as we add more of this metansinol, we're seeing that even on its own, so with no radiation in white, we're seeing this progressive toxicity. And then adding a dose of radiation shows this synergistic um, impact between the two. And so this was out of uh, Tin Tin Su's lab up at University of Colorado Boulder. And in fact, one of our faculty members was a co-author on it, David Rabin. I don't know if he's here today. But anyway, so this was lab work that had been done a long time before this. And the story goes that when they found this effect and this combination with radiation and this drug, uh, not long after this was reported, this drug was bought by, let's just leave them anonymous, a large drug company, and put into human clinical trials. And so this thread was lost. And this potential story was lost until we actually started seeing it on the clinical side. So again, very interesting thread through the University of Colorado, who have really been pioneers in doing some of this research. So anytime you report something at your own center, I think you're incumbent to consider the possibility that perhaps it's something that you're doing and that this isn't something that'll be seen everywhere else in the country. However, that has not proven to be the case. So there's now been several different case report series that have come out from different centers, ranging from two to the largest around 10 patients, describing this exact same um, potentiation of toxicity between this TDM1 therapy and the radio surgery. We have hematomas or bleeding in the brain, delayed cerebral necrosis. Some centers are calling this pseudoprogression, where they're, again, assuming that what they're seeing is necrosis and not tumor. But again, we don't have good, we can't say that for sure until we've actually looked at the pathology. And then again, this uh, last paper was the largest series, all different centers that have put this out. And so it's become a fairly, um, outside of the drug company, it's become a fairly well-accepted phenomenon. <clears throat> 
So we thought to start, we should probably update our experience. And so along with uh, Dr. Stumpf and the Department of Radiation Oncology, we've updated from four. We now have a series of 45, most of whom are HER2 positive. But we also included some patients we considered high risk who were HER2 negative as more of a control in the young women's breast cancer um, group. And so what we're looking at here is they're essentially table one, looking at different variables. This is T, N, and M, or tumor uh, node and metastatic stage at presentation. And so you'll see a wide variety. Many of these patients were treated for cure, meaning they did not have metastatic disease at presentation, but went through a more kind of traditional treatment pathway involving surgery, potentially local radiation, chemotherapy, Herceptin, as we've talked about, and then unfortunately developed metastatic disease in the brain. Our next uh, column over is just describing the number of patients. And then as our exposure, we looked at radionecrosis or no radionecrosis. And so we're seeing, if we look at some of the things we would think would potentially be less involved, like tumor nodes or metastasis up front, which wouldn't necessarily change the biology as we know it thus far, we're not seeing a significant difference in these necrosis uh, versus no radionecrosis patients. Uh, and again, that's reflected in the overall stage grouping, looking at those together. Same thing with brain metastasis at diagnosis. So this was not a common finding in this population. Unfortunately, many of them developed it subsequently, but that didn't seem to be a significant player. As we get down towards the uh, bottom of this table, I wanted to pull your attention to receipt of TDM1. And so if we look at this, uh, there's a very strong um, predictor for those who got radionecrosis versus not. Um, where we see such a, a trend towards radionecrosis in those that received this TDM1 therapy and a trend away from radionecrosis in those who didn't. And just to give the background in this, popula in this uh, population that we're talking about, everyone got radiosurgery. So everyone was exposed to that high-dose focal radiation, which again generally has a fairly low risk of radionecrosis without addition of uh, synergistic agents. And so just to show a brief graph again showing incidence, we're looking at radionecrosis. All patients got radiosurgery and the uh, differing exposures with or without this uh, trastuzumab emtansine or TDM1. What we're seeing is that those that receive the drug plus radiosurgery had about a 40% rate of radionecrosis. This is very, very high compared to the reported literature. Those that got radiosurgery without TDM1 um, was sitting around 5% or so, so a very, very marked difference. And we did see that that was statistically significant. So this supported our observations that we were really seeing this very enriched incidence of this unfortunately very toxic and sometimes even fatal uh, toxicity that can happen from both of these treatments. So we're back to the MRI that we don't want to see. We've got complex imaging interpretation where even our brilliant neuroradiologist can't tell us if there's tumor, necrosis, or both in this area. We've got this potentiation observed clinically here and are in other centers around the world. And we've got this interesting preclinical University of Colorado data that sort of fell by the wayside after the drug was purchased and changed names, but that suggested that this may be a true effect. And so as we're sitting in clinic, we're really thinking, how are we going to talk about this with our patient? Are we going to have to send the patient to surgery? What, what, what are our next steps? And so to really help not just the patient in front of us, but hopefully a lot of women in the future who fall into this clinical scenario, we realized that we had to understand the mechanism of this interaction and how we can potentially prevent it in future patients. So the initial hypothesis was that HER2 was upregulated. And this has been shown in other metastatic sites and so it seemed like a really reasonable way to start. And if I look back at our table one, as you would imagine, HER2 positive also is very predictive. And so it seemed that HER2 positive patients who got this drug perhaps would have this upregulation of HER2 in astrocytes, and that would be the mechanism for toxicity via additional targeting with this TDM1 therapy. So in order to look at this, we actually looked at cells both from uh, human immortalized astrocytes as well as mouse immortalized astrocytes. So the mouse uh, cells are on the uh, left, human on the right. And what we're seeing is um, essentially, let's look at these first two initially. So these are uh, animals that were not, or astrocytes that were not exposed to any drug. And same thing here in the human line, so no drug exposure. And basically what we were looking at was low dose irradiation, yes or no. What we're seeing across this first line is um, HER2. 
And so we're actually seeing in both of those columns that we are seeing some HER2 expression in the mouse astrocytes and in the human astrocytes here and here. As we add, our third column here would be Herceptin. Interestingly, we're seeing a down regulation of HER2. And we saw the exact same thing uh, with TDM1. So both of these HER2 targeting agents with exposure to astrocytes were actually down regulating the process that we had hypothesized would be up regulated. There are a number of other experiments that I didn't show here for time, but essentially based on what we were seeing, and I should show there is also um, uh, PARP cleavage and there is activation of caspases and programmed cell death. So we were seeing that the drug was acting effectively, but we were not seeing that upregulation of HER2 as we would uh, expect. So again, HER2 downregulation, increase in PARP cleavage. So then we met again and said, okay, well, that seemed like a good theory. I wonder what's going on. And so then we started saying, okay, well, everyone who gets this drug has to be HER2 positive. That's the indication. So while that is true that HER2 positivity is associated with this toxicity, that doesn't mean that it's the mechanism. So we started thinking that perhaps we were missing the forest for the trees and that really what we were seeing was this clinically significant edema. So rather than being through the HER2 pathway, could this just have something to do with the fact that we're seeing all this extra fluid on scans, which seems to be the mechanism for this toxicity? So then we started thinking about ways that uh, water channel regulation might actually uh, change. And this aquaporin-4 has been in the news a ton lately. I don't know how it is responsible for so many things. But anyway, it's um, an integral membrane protein, and it helps uh, control water movement across the cell membrane. So in terms of astrocytes, I'm going to show um, here the normal blood-brain barrier. And essentially what we're seeing is that we've got this tight... Uh, uh, fit essentially between the endothelial cells. We can see our aquaporin-4 and then our fairly typical kind of thin non-swollen astrocyte end foots. And so this is how the brain, uh, at least in part, is able to maintain such a tight barrier against uh, harmful chemicals and also chemotherapy and other things getting into it. We then can have disruption of um, aquaporin-4 via upregulation that actually can lead to edema. And this is via two different pathways. I would say we're probably still trying to determine exactly which one it is that we have a clear favorite. In the cytotoxic edema, we're seeing very swollen astrocytes as a hallmark. Um, we're seeing maintenance, more or less, of the endothelial um, cells, but marked upregulation of the aquaporin-4. In the other mechanism, which we strongly favor in this case, it's more of a vasogenic edema. So in this, we actually have frank disruption of the endothelial cells, non-swollen astrocyte end, end foots, and again, this upregulation of aquaporin-4. And so our new hypothesis was that giving TDM1 uh, with stereotactic radiosurgery or high-dose focal radiation was modulating aquaporin-4 expression in astrocytes, and this was leading to that clinical picture of edema and excess toxicity that we were seeing. And so we had a few different aims. I'll go through them um, sequentially. In terms of experimental conditions, again, we had those same immortalized mouse and human astrocytes and then primary human astrocytes. Um, with radiation, we had no radiation, 2, 4, or 8 gray. So we looked at sequential escalation of radiation dosing. And then we similarly used a low and a high dose of both Herceptin or the monoclonal antibody alone or TDM1, the monoclonal antibody linked to the cytotoxic uh, tubulin inhibitor drug that we had discussed. So our first aim was to see whether proliferation was impacted. And so we looked at uh, confluence. And what we're seeing, let me just take you through the uh, graphics here. So we have our control, which was unexposed to any drug. Then we have Herceptin, so red is our low-dose Herceptin, green is our higher-dose uh, Herceptin. And what we're seeing is that Herceptin at both low and high doses is not toxic to astrocytes. So uh, we're seeing the same confluence with Herceptin as if there's no drug exposure at all. Interestingly, if we look at TDM1 at the lower dosing, we're actually seeing a decrease in confluence even in the absence of radiation. So there is some primary mechanism of the drug itself uh, upon these cells. And of interest, both the high-dose TDM1 and the high-dose radiation, the 8 gray, were uniformly fatal to cells. So we know both of these are really dangerous agents for astrocytes, and we have to be very, very careful how we use them. When we then look from our no radiation uh, percent confluence and look at our four gray exposure, we're seeing as expected that all of the um, 
uh, cells would have less confluence at the same time point because of the impacts of radiation. We're again seeing that the control, the low-dose, and the high-dose Herceptin are perfectly overlaid, so we're not seeing that synergy of Herceptin and radiation. Um, and we're now seeing uh, a greater separation of even the low-dose TDM1 in terms of uh, fatality to astrocytes. And again, our high-dose TDM1 was uniformly fatal, as was our high-dose radiation. And these were all um, significant findings. Our second specific aim was to determine whether radiation and TDM1 changes expression in astrocytes. So we could see this proliferation curve. This was done via Western blotting. And um, what we're seeing here is basically that TDM1 increases the levels of aquaporin-4 compared to Herceptin. So if we look across this top row, this is our aquaporin-4. In our control, that was no drug exposure. We're seeing a slight upregulation as we go across radiation and then a drop again at this high radiation dose. With Herceptin, we're actually seeing a downregulation as we increase uh, radiation into the four gray range. And then with TDM1, as hypothesized, as we add this drug to our higher radiation dosing, we're seeing this upregulation of aquaporin-4. This is confirmed as uh, cytotoxic by looking at this upregulation of PARP cleavage or programmed cell death. Our final aim that we looked at was to see whether this correlated to actual changes on um, organotypic slices. So looking at astrocytes under the microscope, are we seeing this association of changes in aquaporin-4 and changes in the astrocyte morphology, essentially? And so um, what we're seeing, and these are two actual uh, cases that we had uh, approved pathology to look at through the neurosurgery department. We're seeing staining for aquaporin-4 and um, GFAP, um, which is uh, glial fibrillary acidic protein. It's a stain for astrocytes. And we're seeing that as we combine these, we're seeing these swollen, abnormal uh, astrocytes associated with this additional aquaporin-4 in both of these cases. And again, this is showing a little better view that we're seeing these abnormal uh, astrocytes associated with this upregulated aquaporin-4. So from what we've done thus far in terms of mechanistic work, it seems that TDM1 in combination is more light, lethal to astrocytes than radiation alone, or when we look at the combination with Herceptin. So just like we've observed clinically, Herceptin and radiosurgery do not seem to cause this extra toxicity, whereas the TDM1 and radiosurgery really do. Um, we found that cells exposed to the TDM1 and this high dose, uh, or escalating dose radiation, I should say, do show increased levels of aquaporin-4, and that we can see at a morphology level these atypical, abnormal, swollen-looking astrocytes um, upon uh, retrieval of tissue from patients who have undergone this clinical scenario. So we're hoping that we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so in terms of our future experiments, we have a lot of things on the plate, but probably one of the more important ones is to use a clinically available drug that actually blocks uh, aquaporin-4 regulation to see if we can block this uh, mechanism that we're seeing. So if we can use this inhibitory agent to actually block the TDM1 and radiation-induced swelling and cell death. And so that will add to the proof of principle that this is truly the mechanism that we're seeing. Um, from, and that, that's more on the research side. In terms of the clinical data, I think uh, looking back through all the literature and piecing this together for this presentation and for our manuscript presentation, I think this knowledge has actually been around for a long time, but unfortunately it hasn't really gotten into practice as we would hope it would. So there's probably been a little bit of a breakdown of the, um, the system of communicating new scientific findings via journals. Maybe it's just the, the preponderance of papers that are out there now and you can't follow everything. So for instance, that initial manuscript that had described this synergistic effect of mantancine at that point in radiation was in I think clinical disease mechanisms or what have you. It was a journal that Probably a lot of clinicians don't get to peruse enough, perhaps. And so that had stayed under the, under the rug for quite some time. Similarly, with our initial case series from 2014, again, it was very small, so four patients. And these additional small series of two or three patients came out over the next couple of years. But that said, most centers and talking to colleagues and friends around the country continue to potentially use TDM1 and radiosurgery in the same patients. <clears throat> 
One story I didn't tell quite as much, but that may help to some extent is that until probably 2014 or so when we started really uh, recognizing this mechanism and gaining some increasing understanding that this could be so toxic, we were running um, TDM1 uh, administrations actually giving the drug fairly close to when radio surgery was. I think at this point we've learned that we have to be really cautious about that and so we do tend to have a further washout. In looking at the data just in a univariate basis, we're not seeing a true kind of concurrent versus sequential tail, um, though I would say that's fairly difficult to tease out. Certainly that depends on how you define concurrent, um, whether the drug has to be on board at the same time, whether you give a weak washout, whether you define it as within a month. So depending on how it's looked at, that, that data may, may change just a little bit. But essentially so far we weren't seeing a significant difference and it may be that just astrocyte exposure to TDM, uh, one therapy in addition to radiosurgery is what it takes and there is that, that change that occurs. So one of our true future directions is to try to get at least the clinical outcomes is the largest, uh, by, by quite a good margin, the largest series that's out there and try to really hopefully get into a journal that enough medical oncologists and radiation oncologists and neurosurgeons and everyone reads that, that we can ideally stop this one day high dose radiation concurrently with TDM1 and try to spare some of our future patients this really profound toxicity and need for neurosurgery with its uh, you know, concomitant decrease in quality of life. In terms of clinical trial design, so I've alluded a couple times to the drug company and I don't mean to make them sound extremely uh, shadowy and shady intentionally, um, but they are uh, generally not acknowledging this toxicity pattern at this moment, and so we are working with them to try to put together some of the, the preclinical data that we've got, as well as the clinical observations, and potentially engage in some productive, more clinical trial design to see how we can safely treat women with brain metastasis and HER2 positive breast cancer. So can we find a way via modulating the dose of radiation and or the dose of drug, changing the temporality of the drug, can we actually get this to a safe place where we can use two really great agents together in these patients? Um, we also, I won't say much about the grant application, but we do have some work we'd like to do further in the lab in terms of the mechanism, and so that's ongoing work with some of my collaborators. In terms of what to do with these patients, so uh, in our clinic we have a new patient tomorrow that falls into this exact category. So myself and some of my other colleagues that treat with uh, radio surgery and are very aware of this, we're discussing how to handle the scenario because it literally happens in our clinic every week and we really don't want to harm these women. We want to make sure we're doing the best care that we know how. So what we've done for the moment is decrease the dose from that 20 to 24 gray in a single treatment to eight gray for three treatments or 24 gray in three fractions. And so this is a gentler way to still give a relatively high dose. It's been adopted in other parts of the body where we want to still give a relatively ablative dose but perhaps not cross that threshold of synergistic toxicity into potentiation with the TDM1 therapy. We're now, of course, tracking these patients in terms of outcomes, and so it's our hope that we can reduce uh, drastically the incidence of this toxicity by modifying the radiation. Of interest, again, though I didn't touch on it in this particular talk, I do also have some patients that have had dose-reduced TDM1 for profound thrombocytopenia, so their platelet counts get to way below 50 in some cases, and so are at risk for uh, spontaneous bleeding. And so those patients typically have a dose reduction of 75%, and sometimes an increased length of time between their cycles of uh, cat Seiler, of TDM1. And of interest, we're not observing that toxicity in this small cohort of patients either. So it may be that modulating either of those agents to a slightly gentler dosing is enough to, to do that. But I would say at this moment, we don't know for sure. We're just trying to be as cautious as possible in using both of these agents together. So revisiting our take home point. So the positive part of the story is that in order to get toxicity, you have to live. So these are women that are getting toxicity a year, two years or more after their therapy with brain metastasis. So we're not talking about three months to a year as our good outcomes for brain metastasis, we're, we're 
trying to push these women out into the five to 10 year range, which is extremely exciting. Um, that said, we have to recognize that there is this synergistic uh, potentiating toxicity that we're observing. So this is gonna continue to be a, a good problem to have where we have to think not just about how to treat the disease today, but how we're gonna deal with this in two years when there's edema in that, in that same area in the MRI brain. Um, at full dosing, radiosurgery and TDM1 uh, potentiate. And so it's truly an, an increase in unwanted side effects and toxicity. If we change our dosing and try to be clever about how we use these two effective agents together, we may be able to make that more of a synergy. In terms of mechanism, so I've showed you what it wasn't, which we thought was the HER2 upregulation, and then also what we think is potentially going on in terms of the aquaporin-4 story, but the work is still ongoing. So again, that work with the inhibitor is one of our more um, exciting new directions that we're heading in. And again, our, our true goal is to improve quality and quantity of life for these women with metastatic uh, HER2-positive breast cancer to the brain. And so we think that this work is going to come back from the excellent bench work that's been going on and really apply directly to how these women are living and how they're treated in the future. So I wanted to go ahead and acknowledge uh, many people that have been involved we have uh, Peter Cabos from Medical Oncology and my other, uh, of course, breast center colleagues in Medical Oncology. In Radiation Oncology, uh, Priscilla Stumpf has helped with a lot of the clinical research. Um, Kelly Storr is our uh, medical physicist who does a inordinate amount of our radio surgery planning and also is very aware of this phenomenon, I think very heads up. Um, she helped me put some of these plans together and is just very thoughtful in terms of her approach. So our whole department is really interested in this topic and making sure that we get the best possible outcomes. Brian Kavanaugh spoke earlier, so he is really one of the founders of this uh, high dose, very focal technique in the brain and, and related techniques in other parts of the body. As I said, I think was very, very forward thinking in terms of moving from that whole brain approach that we talked about with more broad toxicity to the more high dose focal uh, radiation. And then many uh, other radiation on colleagues that I didn't uh, mention by name here. From the pathology side, you probably noticed the unpublished data from the Satelli lab. So Diana Satelli does uh, excellent research in terms of brain metastasis and has really helped us run a lot of these experiments and try to understand the mechanism of what's happening in this specific subset of patients and, and how we're starting to uh, elucidate what, what is going on and how we might prevent this in the future. Within her lab, um, she also has a postdoc, uh, Maria Contreras, and a medical student who's working on uh, his mentored scholarly activity in this, actually, which is really cool. And then in neurosurgery, Ryan Ormond has really developed a true interest and expertise in this area as well and has been incredibly important in helping us um, obviously take care of the patients, but also in thinking about the research and offering access to different samples that we can use. And finally, of course, I have to say a special thank you to our breast cancer patients who are uh, just wonderful women who are going through such a tough treatment and have such uh, confidence and faith in the University of Colorado Breast Center and care team. Thank you. I'd be happy to address any questions. That's a great question. I think many of us uh, who have discussed this in, in different groups and try to dig down into cases that we've seen believe that there is some part of the story that has to do with concurrent versus sequential. But I will tell you, in terms of actually looking at the data, it's not immediately apparent that that's true. And so I'll go back to table one to show you the... Um, the way that we looked at this was concurrent was with uh, administration within a month of radio surgery, and that did not show up as a. Um, so basically, this was concurrent, and we saw here. I'll go back one more without the circle. That was not significant within this cohort. So what really fell out on um, univariate was essentially the the HER2 status, and that is of course intimately associated with TDM1 use. I. I think the way that we define concurrent probably plays a huge role in that. I, I do think there's more to that story, but I would say we're still trying to tease that out of the data. What we did was literally get, uh, this is all Priscilla over there, but we, we basically got the entire drug history 
as well as when radio surgery occurred. And so I think we'll probably have to do a little more sophisticated analysis to try to tease that relationship out in terms of temporality. Great question. Yep. Yep, so that's a good question. Um, I think the, the reason that we thought about using astrocytes is that we primarily think that the mechanism is due not so much to tumor cells because we have a large body of data for radiosurgery and tumor cells, but rather likely the astrocytes uh, that surround and support kind of our, our neurons. And so um, for tumor cells, generally the local control for radiosurgery is depending on your series, 90, 95% plus. So we don't think in most cases that there's viable tumor cells remaining. And again, there is a massive body of literature that I didn't touch on a whole lot in terms of radiosurgery um, efficacy. But our thinking was that it was related more to the, the normal astrocytes around the tumor rather than the tumor. And the way these grow is not like a glioma where it's intrinsic into the brain tissue. It really typically displaces normal tissue around it. So the idea of the radiosurgery is to very focally treat the tumor cells and try to have a sharp fall off where we're not giving substantial dose to nearby tissue. Mm -hmm. I wondered if someone might ask that. Great question. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Your kind of implicit statement that there's probably a lot we don't know about how this traverses the blood-brain barrier. So what we, our sort of global statement to that is that tumor um, microvasculature and promotion of VEGF and what have you changes the, the blood vessels around a, a cancer deposit in the brain where the blood-brain barrier is by nature leakier. And so some agents that perhaps wouldn't have a lot of penetration in a healthy, intact blood-brain barrier might be able to get, get through that area. Um, the, the goal of TDM1, while it is to potentially treat a site that's there, we also think of it as more of an agent of prevention, so where we're trying not to have uh, at the next scan 50 new sites show up. So whole brain actually also did that, where we would treat not only the spots we could see, but also any, any other spots that we're developing. So we wouldn't want the, the um, mechanism of TDM1 to be overly focal. Um, we would ideally, anywhere there's even a small kind of sub-detectable deposit of cells, we'd want that to have its efficacy. Any other questions? All right, thanks for your attention.